Imagine a city of dreamers and visionaries. Artists and groundbreakers. Consider the world as they saw it through their eyes. See what inspired them to turn dreams into realities. And how we can build upon what they've created. days when you get a phone call from someone who says, you know, we've just acquired this new building and we wanted you to go look at it. And so it's like, oh, what are we getting into? It was a grand auditorium space. The ceilings were chopped to pieces. And surrounding the existing curtain and stage was a beautiful mural depicting notable personalities from the history of the city, whether it was Oglethorpe, or Button Gwinnett, or Tom Achichi. So I walked over to Arnold Hall and I took a look at the mural on the proscenium. What we had was an attempt at depicting the Savannah origin story. It was painted in 1933 to celebrate Savannah's bicentennial. Over a half of Savannah's population was excluded. There was only one person of color and no women. So I asked myself, where are all the women? To honor SCAD's hometown heroines, I created the Savannah Women of Vision Investiture. Mary Musgrove Matthews Bosomworth was born of Yamakra and European ancestry. She took advantage of her biculturalism to serve as interpreter between the British colonists and the Muscogee Creek tribe. With her help, a peaceable settlement for the lands south of the Savannah River was attained. For her role in negotiations, she was granted three Georgia islands and established a successful trading post. When her ownership of the lands was called into question, a meeting was convened where the men of the colony would decide Mary's proprietorship. She was not admitted into the session, but Mary Musgrove Matthews Bosomworth refused to wait outside. The official meeting place was the old trading post. That's where the governor and people wanted the meeting to take place. And he very much disparaged her on a personal level. She was immediately arrested but ultimately, she was granted one of the islands, where she later died. Around the time of Miss Musgrove's death in the 1760s, Abigail Minus found herself a widowed mother of eight. Among Savannah's first Jewish settlers, Abigail spoke broken English, but what she lacked in education, she made up for in business acumen. She established a successful tavern, which with her five daughters, she ran with tremendous success. Abigail, her story still really resonates with people today. The struggles that she faced in her life are ones that I do also. She was a mother, she was a wife, she was a business person. So I find that inspirational that she was so successful. Matilda Beasley's crusade against the laws that kept her people enslaved began in New Orleans at her birth in 1832. The daughter of a slave, when she came of age, she ran a secret school for the African-American children of Savannah. She did this at great personal risk, as the practice ran in strict contravention with state law. When Juliet Gordon Lowe was six years old in 1866, the 14th Amendment was passed, defining citizens exclusively as male in the Constitution. Despite the restrictions the law placed on the women of her time, she became a revolutionary spokesperson for gender equality. In 1912, she attended a meeting of the Boy Scouts. She went home that night and told a friend, we need something for the girls of Savannah. She immediately formed a group called American Girl Guides, the precursor to the Girl Scouts of America, 
which counts a membership of 60 million strong. Juliette gordon Lom created this huge organization that has impacted so many lives. I was a Girl Scout starting from Brownie through 12th grade. And what I learned within the program was the importance of friendship, the importance of leadership, the importance of community service. When Seema Wiltz was born in 1907, it was less than a decade after every state had passed legislation allowing women the right to keep their own wages. She opened a restaurant called The Wilkes House, which she ran for 60 years. She always said, if you serve a good meal at a fair price, you never have to worry about your business. No one called her anything but Ms. Wilkes. She was never called by her first name, which is Seema. Even my granddaddy called her Ms. Wilkes, you know. I grew up there as a little girl. One of my favorite memories is having breakfast with my grandmother. When people said, who's the most important person that's been here, she would say, you and you and you, and she really meant it. Since the city's very earliest days, women have assumed the mantle of leadership in Savannah. And nowhere has this been more apparent than in their efforts to preserve her historic squares and buildings. Savannah is, I mean, it is a good old boys town. The history of Savannah and the town it is, it's the women that started preservation here, not the men. Claremont Lee designed the gardens at five of Savannah's magnificent squares. But in the 1950s, there was a plan to scrap the squares of Savannah altogether. To make way for the new long buses, the bus companies were going to tear down the statues and fountains and run the bus lanes right through the squares. But Claremont Lee didn't want to see her gardens reduced to asphalt. My Aunt Claremont Lee was a very unique individual. She was the first female landscape architect licensed in the state of Georgia and ignored the fact that women were not supposed to be doing these things at the time. Claremont proposed the idea of rounding the corners of the squares. They rounded the squares as she suggested, and a compromise was reached. But in the 1950s in Savannah, it wasn't just the squares and statues that were at risk. Many of our historic buildings had seen a steep decline in recent years and were in danger of becoming the parking lots and tract homes and strip malls they had become in so many other cities. Mary Lane Morrison made sure that our historic buildings would not be eliminated. A noted photographer and illustrator, she photographed many of Savannah's historic buildings, including Scad's Mars Hall. And her photographs were displayed at the 1929 World's Fair. She transcribed the records of Savannah's early buildings, preserving their architectural plans. In the 70s and 80s, this work was continued by Savannah's historic preservationists. To be in Savannah, you really realize how one person can make such a difference and do something that has so many ripples. To me, what is most gratifying is working with others, having a project that is worthwhile the arts, education, and historic preservation, children's hospital, I think they're all such worthy causes. Nancy N. Lewis was an accomplished landscape artist and a student of SCAD. But instead of selling her oil paintings, she would ask that a donation be made to a local charity. This generosity continued in her private life. The Cancer Research Center that bears her name stands as the pinnacle of a life spent in service to others. Emma Adler is a lifelong advocate, a lifelong activist, which is at the heart of historic preservation. We've had tremendous involvement with historic preservation when I was quite young, that the Chamber of Commerce wanted Savannah to look like Jacksonville and come into the 20th century, and I thought, baloney. It was their efforts that preserved these structures, passing on the responsibility to the next generation. In the 1990s, I believe there were about 115 potential storefronts, and of that, 90 plus were vacant. Everyone moved to the suburbs. President Wallace has a keen eye for things that are of historic value. SCAD's participation on Broughton Street by way of the theater, Gen Library, 
Dormitories, Norris Hall, one of the earliest buildings, helped bring about the revitalization of that part of the city. In 1935, I went to dancing school at Bagard's Armory, and that's this building that we're in right now. The B.B. Jacobs Synagogue, which is now the one right across from the courthouse. I got married in that building. Skad's preservation efforts are the greatest thing that's happened to Savannah since the day I was born. I went into the real estate business at 23. I had already had two children. I was one of the early women in real estate in Savannah, probably one of the first five. Doctors' wives, lawyers' wives, all these prominent women would come into my office and say, can I get a real estate license to work for you? They saw that I was becoming free, and they wanted to be free. There is a common ground in everyone. There is a deep and rich history to all of our beginnings, and one that I'm always wanting to learn more about. Flannery O'Connor's indelible characters were never indifferent. Her writing was permeated by tension and irony. One of the most prolific and beloved short story writers of the 20th century, she published 32 such works and two novels. She did all this despite losing her battle with lupus before her 40th birthday. We sometimes talk about being unapologetic about who you are and during a time when that wasn't always the standard approach for women, Flannery's voice really captures that sense of, this is who I am, and I'm not going to feel bad about it. Frances Wong was an esteemed educator and administrator who began in the Savannah public school system. She then went on to a career in higher education at SCAD. It was difficult to be female as well as Asian. She was just such a quiet person. She never spoke about what she did. Paula Wallace spoke about how my aunt just viewed every student as if they were her child. My aunt was someone that throughout her life avoided the spotlight, but now the spotlight has found her. Frederica Washington was among the first African-American women to land a starring role in a Hollywood motion picture. Her film, Imitation of Life, was nominated for the Best Picture Oscar. She was a revered actor. But unable to find much work in her time, producers would not cast her in romantic roles because the film production code prohibited miscegenation, the mixing of different racial groups. She retired from Hollywood and became a founding member of the Negro Actors Guild of America, where she continued to work as a lifelong advocate for civil rights. My name is Leah Ward Sears. I wanted a good education and I wanted to go somewhere. At that time, you could be a teacher, or you could be a nurse, or go marry a rich guy. And I didn't want to, oh, I wouldn't mind marrying a rich guy. <laughs> I was the first African-American woman at a major law firm here in the city when I graduated, and I just kept getting pushed ahead, pushed ahead, pushed ahead. After Savannah High School, Leah Ward Sears reached the Ivy League at just 16 years of age. She then went on to become the youngest state Supreme Court justice in U.S. history. Edna Jackson, was the first African-American woman to become mayor of Savannah. I grew up here in this wonderful city. We were raised to speak to everybody. I don't care if you ran up and down the street. 50 times a day, you had to say, how you doing, Miss Lula Allen? How you doing, Miss Georgia Reed? Hi, Miss Funny. And if you didn't, by the time you got home, my grandmother would know it. But it was during that time when the Civil Rights Movement was beginning. You know the rules. You couldn't sit at the counters. We didn't go to Broughton Street just to eat at the lunch counters. We wanted jobs. We wanted people ringing the cash registers. We didn't want to be just the cooks. All the mayor wanted was to stand on equal footing. Did she imagine back then how far she would go? I feel that I have to set the example. There are not many people that look like me in my position. The more 
people learn of my presence and the other women on Wall Street making a difference. When people ask me about, you know, what was one of your proudest moments, I could say, oh, it's the $800 million deal we did for New York City, but I think it's the $15 million deal we did for the Savannah Airport because it was the first time I had done a deal in my hometown. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. But Savannah was very segregated growing up. We put on Romeo and Juliet. There was never an opportunity that I might play Juliet because, you know, Juliet kisses Romeo and Romeo was going to be white. I remember walking into the all white school and I remember the line breaking. The lucky thing was I had my mother teaching fourth grade at the school. And when it got to be too much, I would excuse myself and I'd go to my mother's classroom and we would go in the cloakroom and she would just hold me and I would just cry. My best friend all my life was a young black woman just three years older than I. There was a Habersham street car. She had to sit on the back. We'd go to the movies together. She had to sit in the balcony and I sat downstairs. So I have always resented that. It was hard preparation for me to walk in to the Georgia Supreme Court on the first day as the only woman, black, and to be able to thrive there. I want it to be men and women. I want it to be black and white. And I don't want us to ever see people in color. I want us just to see people. I've learned that we all were in it together. We're all in the same boat together. We want to see something become successful. The role of the mayor is to bring people together. These are the women who helped Savannah stand the test of time. These are the stories that inspire all of us. These are the women who fought for us. They fought for gender equality and freedom, forged achievements in arts, education, and commerce. We stand out among each other. These are Savannah's pioneers. SCAD has really changed the Savannah I knew. These are the stories that inspire all of us. Today, we continue the work of our sisters who came before us, the Savannah Women of Vision.